Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight we are looking at the book of Genesis, chapter 38, and I want to write on uh, because of time, make us realize why the reason why uh, this particular scriptures were arranged this way. So, you know, last week we talked about Joseph, and you expect that you should follow up the story of Joseph straight. But then, in between the story of Joseph, they give Joseph a chapter, and then they brought in the story of Judah. And this story of Judah is peculiar because uh, the scripture wanted to show us, uh, God wanted to show something through the scripture about how it works out the dynamics of reality. So, Oftentimes, when we are looking at the scriptures, we have a very mono uh, direction, uh, which is uh, we are always looking at the, the lens of the scripture through one uh, through one eye, through one through one vision. So we we'll look at the story of Adam and Eve, and they are the ones we we'll focus on, and then we we'll focus on Cain and Abel, and then we we'll focus on Enoch, and then we we'll focus on Noah. And when we do that, we forget that all around them, other people are also living, other people are also doing stuff. Oftentimes, because the writer of the scripture couldn't chronicle the life of everybody, he had to choose only the life of the person that matters, the lineage of Jesus. So basically, the scriptures that we read is centered around the lineage of Jesus from the book of Genesis down to the book of Matthew. So you'll see in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, how they did the chronology up until Adam, and that all the people that were listed in the chronology of Jesus Christ, in the genealogy, rather, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, these are the people that we read about, people like David, uh, Ataliah, uh, Tama, this Tama, and others. You'll see that basically from the Old Testament, there was a there was a, a genealogical chronicling from Adam right up to Jesus. And so, uh, even though that wasn't the only family in the world at that time, or in the, at any time, they weren't the only family in the world throughout history, they were the only and the most important family because through that lineage would Jesus be born. So we have been following from Abraham we followed to Isaac, then we followed to Jacob. Now, Jacob has 12 sons, and Joseph has a lesser role to play, while Judah has a greater role to play. The role of Joseph will be the savior of the world in the short term, while the role of Judah is to be the one to produce the scepter, the Christ, in the long term. So for the first time, we saw a split. We saw that the scripture began to talk of the of Joseph, the one that, that is going to save the world in the short term uh, as, he, as the story will progress into Egypt. And immediately after that, the scripture jumped to the, to the one, to Judah, the one who will continue this lineage because uh, the blessing had been given to him. But even here, the blessing has not been given to him yet. The blessing would later be given to him by his father when the father would say that the scepter will not depart from Judah. But right here, even Judah did not know that he was going to end up bearing the scepter. But God already knows. So while God was working on Joseph's story in order to, to make him fulfill destiny, God started working also on Judah so that Judah's relevance and his progression in the story as the scepter bearer and the one upon whom it rests to continue the lineage uh, as his own story progresses too. So for the first time, we are, going, we are looking at scripture through the lens of Joseph, and then we are coming back to look at the lens of Judah, both of them significant uh, in their role. So the story of Judah and his three sons was simply that it was time for, the, for Judah to begin to have children. And Judah was the one that has been found to be without blame among Joseph's, among Jacob's children. Uh, this, this I mean by saying Joseph, uh, Jacob's firstborn slept with his concubine. That 
uh, his father already had misgivings about him. We were not, like I said, we were not told how that story came about, but we will later hear about it in the book of, uh, later in the book of Genesis. But we were not told how he saw the girl or what made him uh, or the girl appeal to him or why he slept with the girl. But we know that uh, his father was sleeping with the girl and he also ventured into that same path and it, it became an issue. So that's point one, that his father had was given about the firstborn. Now we, we were told the story of Diana, how the secondborn, Le Levi and Simeon, how the two of them took the whole town of Shekel and killed them. So that also means the father had misgivings about them. So the first born step with the father's wife, father had misgivings, second and third born, uh, third children, <coughs> killed the whole city and uh, caused Jacob to flee from Shechem to Bethel and caused him to panic and gave him a lot of stress. So their father had misgivings about them. So the natural person that we will look at to continue the lineage now will be child number four. This is Judah. So Judah got married and had three sons. Uh, the, the three sons were, were raised uh, in such a manner that, uh, let's put the English, the right English, were raised according to the Jewish custom. But at that time, there was really, uh, the, the, the culture was still adaptable. Uh, that, this is important because some of the decisions they made here, they made according to, to their nature, to their human nature. But the reason it was peculiar was because they were holding God back from his plan. So God knew that Judah was going to be the one to produce to continue the lineage that to produce Jesus. God knew that. But these boys didn't know that. Because if they knew, they would, they would quickly, they would be married and they would be good people. They would be happy and proud to be the progenitors of Jesus Christ. But they didn't know. They were just normal boy and the, one of them got married. And the one that got married, the Bible said, was wicked in his attitude, in his action, in his behavior. Uh, that means his DNA had issues. It means there's something wrong with his, with his makeup. And we are looking for the seed here that will produce the likes of David, that will produce the likes of Solomon. So that DNA was, was not good enough. So the Bible said God killed the, the firstborn of Judah. So, you know, typically as a parent, God forbid anybody lose their child. Uh, a parent should be unhappy uh, that they lost their child. Eh, that, oh, eh died. So Judah didn't know that it was God that killed eh. Judah uh, assumed that, okay, uh, maybe one of those things, casualties, you know, life happens. And according to their tradition, Onan, the second born, was supposed to continue to produce a child for the first born. Now let me pause here and say this. Uh, because many of us in our Christian uh, upbringing uh, didn't understand the peculiarities of the Jewish society. And as such, we quote scriptures and we quote them upside down. When the Bible was saying that none shall lack a mate, uh, and I know many people who are single here, uh, they pray with that scripture. You will notice that that scripture was in the Old Testament. And the reason that scripture was very relevant was because the Jewish system was so so programmed to ensure that no woman, except by choice, can ever be alone. Right from when the a young lady reaches the age of puberty, she doesn't need somebody to come and toast her. 
according to their system, they have what you call marriage brokers. Marriage brokers are the elders at the city gates. They sit down there at the city gates uh, to judge all matters. Either the matter is a land dispute, either it is on marriage, either it is on paternity fraud, either it is on cheating, whatever the case may be, there are always elders at the city gates to judge these issues. So a, a potential father or the father of a man who is old enough to marry or who, who finds a, a particular family uh, useful or, or marriageable would go to the city gate and talk to the elders there that, oh, uh, my name is so-and-so, I have a son, so-so-and-so age. Uh, I would like that son to marry from the tribe of Benjamin, from the family of uh, Shoma. And this, the elders of the city gate would call this family and say, okay, this man wants to marry from your family. And then the other man will say, oh, I have a daughter. And then they will betroth the children together. So they grew up knowing that they were going to get married to so-and-so. There was no room for somebody to grow up hoping that, oh, let me just go and wear fine clothes and go and, and, go and sit at the mall. Maybe God will open somebody's eyes to see me. You know, this Western thing that, that we practice and that many people pray about, and these are structured in the Jewish society in such a manner that, that you, you would never, except in case of sickness, uh, she didn't want to marry, or, or she has a mental health or challenge or a physical health challenge, you would never ever find a Jewish young woman who is not betrothed to be married. They, they, they are betrothed early. And the marriages are always arranged. They do not marry for love. Again, they don't do janima. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> they don't do all the their nonsense. Uh, they don't do all the write me a letter thing. So that that was how they structured the society. Secondly, so that they ensure that none shall lack a mate indeed. If they betrothed a woman to a man, that woman is the wife, not only of that man, but she is the wife of that man and a potential wife to all the man's male siblings. Again, that puts paid to the idea that uh, Israel was only in a monogamous system. They, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't come up with an idea of, oh, if the spouse dies, then the woman, the woman is uh, helpless or the woman will not be provided for. That, that was not their system. So if a, a woman marries a man and the man dies young, it is the man's younger brother that would take the responsibility of uh, this woman and children. If she doesn't have children before, he has the responsibility to produce a child through her. But that child will not be called this child. It would be, the child will be named after the late brother so that that child can continue the lineage of the brother. And under no circumstances shall the biological father claim to be the, to be the essential father, to be the legitimate father. Again, the biological father has no claim to legitimacy over that child because that child will bear the name of the late brother and they inherit the estate of the late brother without any contention. So you see in their society, non shalak it wasn't a prayer point. It was structured into the society itself so that a man and a woman marries, the woman knows that no matter what happens to my husband, I'm protected, the family, will take care of me. So many of you remember the story of Ruth and the issue of the kinsman redeemer. Yeah, so that man that marries wife, her husband dies, is the kinsman redeemer. But normally it's supposed to be the brother. But if there is no brother, then somebody within that family also, a male within that family also, could be an uncle, 
would be a cousin would be the one responsible to marry her and make sure that she lacks nothing. That was how their society was structured. So this is this was why Onan had to marry uh, had to marry Tama here. So when Onan now married Tama, Onan has the responsibility of producing a child through Tama for the brother, for heir, not for himself. He has the right of producing a child for the brother. He can marry his own wife and he would have his own wife if he wants and, and have two wives. But this girl that belong, that married the brother must have, the brother must have a child. That brother died does not mean uh, he has died and he cannot have offspring. No, the, the younger brother will produce a child through his wife for him. But this man realized that, oh, uh, selfishly, he just wanted to have sex, but he didn't want to get the girl pregnant. And again, what he did was delaying God's plan because Joseph had already gone to fulfill a part of the plan and Judah must fulfill his own part of the plan so that by the time they will move to Egypt, this lineage of Jesus would continue. So there was a timing thing here. There was a timing thing here that that had to be said to the children that will continue the lineage of Jesus through Judah must have been born. But then this one was now doing sex without uh, responsibility, without our method. And so again, he died. Now you know the funniest thing. When the boy died, this time around, Judah now assumed in his head that it will be the girl that has a problem. Apologies to the ladies that people just blame ladies for everything in the marriage. If the man dies, her fault. If the, whatever happens to the man is her fault. But this is this is typical here. So Judah, Judah looked at it and felt, "You married my firstborn. Firstborn died. You married my secondborn. Secondborn died. Ah, maybe you are under a curse, or maybe there is a problem with you." So Judah was not afraid to give him, to give her his third child, even though the boy was quite young at the time. So the boy was growing, and they told the woman that you, if you stay here, there's nobody to marry you. Go back to your parents' house. When this boy matures, you have to wait a few years. But this boy, as soon as he's 16, 17, and he can make a baby, he will be given to you to make a baby for your husband, not for himself. Again, that is why a boy of 16 year old can sleep with a lady that is 40 year old in, in their culture, and it's allowed. Because the, the sex they were having, was this boy well, it will be a pseudo husband but the baby that they make will not be his responsibility the baby would own his real the real father's estate so i believe i've, I've overflowed that i've explained it very well so so then uh when the boy was 16 and tama had been waiting that okay when he's 16 i'll get married to him judah didn't call tama back to the house uh, for any reason. Tama heard that the boy is now 16, the boy is now mature, cannot make a baby, but uh, Judah did not, was afraid that the boy would die if he slept, if he should sleep with Tama. So he, he was protecting his last, his only remaining son from dying young. And maybe you won't blame him. I, I wouldn't blame him dead personally. Uh, if, if, I didn't, if I didn't hear from the Holy Spirit, I would have assumed truly that something was wrong with that girl. So the girl decided that you have married me. I cannot marry any other person. Uh, you have a son. You didn't want to give me the son. Okay, I'm going to find a way to sort out myself. So the girl went to position herself on the part where Judah takes uh, and position herself like a prostitute. Now, the whole prostitute in those days will wear a veil. The reason they will know prostitutes is that uh, there's a way she will wear a uh, a particular jewelry, there's a way she will wear a particular jewelry, and then she will cover her face, and then she will be standing alone without a man with her. Usually, in their culture, uh, women and men work together, they do not leave women unprotected, and then they do not allow women to wear uh, their, their jewelry in a certain way unless they are prostitutes. So, it's easy for them to identify uh, prostitutes. I definitely don't want to mention how it is one so that. You know, we are in a course, we are now in the free world. <laughs> we want people to start telling me story after class now. 
I use your imagination. The Lord bless you. Anyway, so this girl, Judah saw her, and somehow he was drawn to her, but he didn't have any money. So he had sex with her, and then he left his walking stick and his signet ring with her, and told her, I will go home and get you your prize, and then I'll, I'll ransom back my ring and my walking stick. Uh, by the time he returned, the girl was gone. But the girl somehow knew, maybe the Holy Spirit showed her, maybe an angel told her, maybe it was just an angel of the Lord that moved her. Because it just happened to be that that one sex got her pregnant. It was like one chance in very big odds. And she got pregnant. Now, Judah that wouldn't give her had the son heard that the girl is pregnant and now he felt oh that means because according to the tradition she's still their wife she's still their wife in that family because they didn't divorce her they were just waiting for the boy to grow up so that they can continue the conjugal relationship so he felt oh you are you are ah now we have to kill you and 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 he went straight to the girl's house he has by law has the right uh to in those days uh kill an adulterous woman. And so he went there, and in the course of discussion, the girl told everybody that uh, the person that don't have this pregnancy is the owner of this ring and this, and Judah realized that, oh, uh, this girl had outsmarted me. Because naturally, he shouldn't sleep with his children's wife, uh, as a son shouldn't sleep with the father's wife or either is the one that's married to her, is the mother or another wife. Uh, all those ones are abominable acts. But in this case, the girl was getting older and she needed uh, to produce that hair to deliver that child. So Judah, the one upon whom the blessing will later come, became now produced through her, uh, the children. The lesson I wanted that I really want us to learn from this is how, when we look at the lineage of Jesus, how clumsy that lineage is. You know, many of us, our stories are not so well put together. You know, some of us here, uh, maybe you are from a single parent home, uh, maybe you are an orphan, maybe, maybe, a, an uncle impregnated your mom or you know not not everybody has a tidy story and the typical church that we have today uh likes neat stories it's one of the <laughs> it's a very very funny thing they when you look at maybe sunday school manuals you will see marriage maybe they will talk about marriage for four classes and you will never see them mentioning those who have single, those who are single parents, uh, those who are divorced, uh, those who are widows, uh, they, 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 it seems like they, 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 they forget that they are part of the society. Uh, they forget that they too have struggles and that the Sunday school, if you are going to really represent the society as society is, our Sunday schools must be open-minded to include them. But then, uh, that's, that's not what I see. I've been in church for a long time. I noticed that we basically just pretend as if those ones, those ones are not really, are not, they don't really matter. And we focus on the typical husband and wife, children relationship. Uh, we forget, you know, I used to say it when I used to teach on the school in a particular church, that I forget that the single mother you find somebody to sleep with you that you are saying, oh, typical man and woman, love yourself. It is your husband that they are coming for. If you don't, if you don't by yourself sit down and make arrangements and sit down and say, how do we, how are we going to include these women, these widows, these uh, these uh, single mothers, these single parents? If you don't sit down and find a way to integrate them into the gospel and share the bread of the gospel with them, if you continue to act as if they are inconsequential because their stories are not neat. Then it will surprise us one day when 
one of them gets pregnant and it's the husband of it's the pastor of the church that gave her pain. Like everybody will start shouting, scandal, scandal. But it is basically because of the way society has been programmed to treat them as if they are outsiders rather than include them and allow them to see their intrinsic worth, self-worth, and allow them to have the fullness of the liberty to express their reality through the Holy Spirit as individuals, not as salt doves or as accused or as the or as the rejected of society, all those terms that I often would associate with uh with people that maybe had a child outside wedlock or what have you, all those terms should not be found in the church. Those are Western, Western ideals that was brought into the gospel. The gospel was all inclusive. In the early church, in the book of Acts, there are a lot, a lot of people whose story was like the one I just described. Somebody that did, uh, that was all the Jews. This is their typical story, the Jews. If somebody died, the younger brother would uh, help him produce a child uh, through his wife. Uh, it would be another person that would do the king's part. These are the people that got converted into Christianity. They didn't create other people. These are the first set of Jews that give their life to Christ. And they were accepted like that. Polygamy, polygamous people were accepted in the early church. The, the only people that were not allowed the only thing they were not allowed to do was lead. That was why the scriptures would say, husband of one wife. If everybody had one wife, they wouldn't put that qualification when it comes to leadership. Leadership had all sorts because the Jewish society was a polygamous society with all forms of dysfunctional in between, dysfunctional reality in between. The woman by the world that Jesus Christ spoke to, she had how many? Six? And Jesus called the last person she was sleeping with her husband. She was the one that told Jesus that, no, she's not my, he's not my husband. I'm just living with him. But Jesus didn't say, you have to understand how Jesus saw it. So this lady was sleeping, is sleeping with a man. And she, she and the man are already having sex. They are relating in a couple way. To God, they are married. It is the woman, according to earthly teaching, that said, he's not my husband. I'm just, I'm just living with him. Jesus defined that relationship as marriage and called the woman she was with, the man she was with, her husband. When you read the scripture the way you are supposed to read it, you will realize that Jesus does not make mistakes with words. He defines things the way they are. And then when the woman said, oh, she's not my husband, I'm just staying with him. He now said, it is true. You are not married to him. That is, you didn't do the normal ceremony, but by definition, you are living with him he offers protection, uh, whatever they offer to each other. Uh, that's the definition of being together. So it is important that we know this. And this is the lesson I like everybody to, to, to learn, to not to look at somebody and begin to, as believers especially, and act as if it is the perfect family. is the family where daddy, mommy, three children, that is the one that is acceptable to God. That would be a lie. The lineage of Jesus tells a different story entirely. There was, a, there was a prostitute in the lineage of Jesus. There was this tamer that was very hard in the lineage of Jesus. There was this tamer. There was a queen that was almost a witch, Atalaya. She's in the lineage of Jesus. If you look at all the women in the, the lineage of Jesus, you'll be like, oh my God. You'll be like, oh my God. There was a foreigner there, a Moabites called Ruth in the lineage of Jesus. The grand, she's the grandmother of David. And so, and God accepted all of these ones in the beloved, and God allowed them to be registered and written in the lineage of Christ. So there is nobody that God rejects, and there is nobody that that God sees as as uh, as uh, as the dredges of society, or that uh, they are not good enough for salvation. So our duty as believers is to make sure that our gospel is inclusive, and that our gospel offers to these people the right level of love. Hope, faith, knowledge of the reality that they have in Christ, and uh, and fellowship as a church. We must always remember this. And if you are in this kind of shoe, God loves you. Chin up, dress well, tell yourself, God loves me. God is not angry with you. God does not hate your past mistakes. But as soon as you have stepped into your boat, he's changing your reality for better, you begin to see that from today, there's glory, 
there's power, the doors will open unto you. You will be the kind of the kind of believer that Jesus is really, really proud of. This is where I'm going to stop this evening. I believe we've learned one or two things in the course of this Bible study. If you have, I'd like you to shout glory. Glory.